So what I want to do this evening is I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts and visions on the art of seeing black and white. Um, I'll talk to you about um, some of the um, reasons for, let's switch screens real quick here, some of the reasons for um, shooting in black and white, um, reasons for why you would want to do it, what to look for, uh, some of the differences between color and black and white. Um, obviously not just color and no color, uh, but a lot of some of the philosophical reasons, the reasons why, as I mentioned, why you would shoot black and white. As we go through this, um, obviously questions are going to pop up, so go ahead and jot, jot them down in the chat box. We'll do the best we can afterwards to answer them. I will say this if to uh, Lisa and Crystal, if several people chime in with one question at the same time, feel free to stop me. Um, and ask us no problem, but we'll get to what we can afterwards. So then I'm going to show you about three or four different black and white conversions in Lightroom and in Photoshop. There's about 17 to date out there, different types of conversions. So we won't get into all that, but I'll just show you um, my favorites. And I would say that the best way, I mean, you don't need to know all 17 conversions in order to know which one to use at a certain time. I would find one or two that you understand and can enjoy and do very easily and just stick with those and learn those. Uh, so that's about an hour of content, 50 to 60 minutes roughly, and then we'll do quick Q&A after that. So let's just jump right in here. So black and white has been the foundation of my photography. Years and years ago when I started this process working with my dad, he was very much on the impression that black and white was a very strong, powerful medium to work in. He wanted me to start learning in black and white with black and white film so that I would have a better understanding of how to communicate my feelings, my statements, help the client view their images and understand the stories and the messages I was sending a lot better with that. And I think the reason what's come down to, for me for that is that I believe that our, <clears throat> our eyes see color, but our souls feel black and white. That's kind of the whole premise for this, um, this whole program this evening, is just to really share with you the difference between color photography and black and white photography. When I approach a scene to photograph, I don't just see the colors. I see the light, the direction, the line, shape, and form, I see the content and the subject, and I see color. Color is just one of the elements. Now, of course, when we're down in Southwest Colorado in the fall, and we come around that mountain, that road, and we see those beautiful aspen trees from the light yellows to the flaming red oranges, that's a good reason to photo use color. Color is obviously standing out there, so that's a reason we'd want to do that. But I love color, I do. I love the standing in the middle of a mountain meadow at pre-sunrise, watching the soft pastel colors, the warm tones of the flowers against the cool tones of the grasses. And as the sun rises through the blue hour and golden hour, as it changes, the sky changes from blues and pinks and magentas to yellows and oranges and fiery reds of the sunrise. I mean, that's an amazingly beautiful scene. Or standing deep in the woods somewhere, maybe the rainforest, where light is very low, colors are very, very saturated, very deep and rich. The trees almost have a burgundy, rusty color to them. The foliage, the underbrush has this very deep greens and cyans and blues. And then just the faint crisp of yellow light streaming through the trees are all very beautiful colors. But as I mentioned, those as I described those scenes to you, they're all about color. Color has become the subject. So while that's all fine and good, I feel like sometimes that might be a reason to use black and white. So imagine color photography as if you were looking at an impressively, impressively colorful scene while standing behind a large plate glass window. You can see the meadows of green, the colorful wildflowers, the crisp white of the rapids in the Wandering Creek. You can see the snow-capped mountain peaks and the brilliance of the waterfall raging off the cliff's edge. 
and all against the sky of the night, the richest blue you can ever remember seeing. It's beautiful, it's delightful, and it's beyond words. Now imagine black and white photography as breaking that plate glass window and wandering into this wondrous scene. You can feel the crisp breeze, smell the sweetness of the wildflowers, hear the rapids in the creek. You can touch the rocks, the plants, and the trees. You can wander anywhere you wish. You can experience any emotions that arise. You can take with you any memories or feelings, even if they are of solitude, pleasure, pain, or sadness. This is your experience. You see, color is descriptive, but black and white is interpretive. So I think as you go through this program tonight and you start going out and photographing your own, you're going to start looking at your scenes differently based on the story, based on what statement you're trying to make with their, your photography. Some reasons for photographing black and white, because obviously it communicates better. Look at all the years of photojournalism that recorded, obviously for reasons that there was only black and white film for many years, but the stories that are told. Black and white also allows us to convey a message or a statement. It tells a stronger, more compelling story. And it helps share emotions and feelings much easier. We also allow black and white photography to assist the viewer to better understand the image and the story that we're trying to tell. For you don't just shoot black and white because it's more artsy. You shoot black and white because it better communicates how you feel. Now, color photography allows us to capture colors in their amazing, provocative, and pleasing grandeur. It allows you to photograph a scene in its natural, unaltered state. It allows you to record a scene more as it was when it was, we experienced it. And capture the color and saturation as our minds think a scene should be. Notice I said we think a scene should be. There's a lot, I've noticed a lot of photographers when they're starting out, and in any age, doesn't matter, but the beginners usually love scenes. They love the flowers, the waterfall, the birds, and they go get a camera and they start recording the scene that they see. And then they sit down at their computer and as they learn to process, they're trying to recreate the scene as they saw it. Absolutely fine, nothing wrong with that. But then I see as they progress in their education, some are faster than others, they start looking at different ways to create a different look. Black and white, a lot of times, allows them to totally open their, themselves up to the art. And it's pretty amazing to see um, what can happen there. But I will say that when color becomes the subject, it can also become a barrier. You think about the scenes that I described earlier in the talk, beautiful color scenes, and that's fine. We love color scenes. There's a lot of wonderful color out there these days. and a lot of times it ends up being the reason the photograph happens. But I've found, and many people have found over the years, that once you take that color barrier down, you have such a tremendous opportunity to do a lot of different interpretations. Black and white photography initially allows the viewer to explore the scene, enjoy the lines, the textures, the shapes, and the form. But on a much more intimate level, it allows you to feel the image to explore the emotions, to engage in the depth of the image, and analyze, understand, and accept the message or the statement. And what I find fascinating is that just taking down that color barrier, and I don't mean to say that in a negative way, but once you get past that, the human mind goes through these steps. And the bottom line is it allows the story to touch hearts and souls. And that's what we're all about. And this is to create a fine art piece that is just something you can't tear your eyes or your heart away from. So some of the differences between color and black and white photography, obviously color or lack of color, but I don't think a black and white is a lack of color. I think the tones of a black and white image are the colors of that image, if you will. I'll let that sink in for just a moment. <clears throat> black and white is a very, very personal choice. As I said, because of the possibilities of being able to really dive into a scene and tell a complex story or deliver a message or a statement. It becomes a very personal choice for photographers. I know it is for me. It's also a step away from reality. Think about the last time you walked into a gallery and you see all the images on the wall. And the first thing that always catches my mind is the 
handcuff that we all have. We're all forced to shoot with that same damn format, that 35 millimeter format that I've never liked, to be honest with you. But we all have that same format to deal with and all the pictures look the same. So anything you can do to make your images look different, to create your own style, it makes people more excited. They'll see your images first. If you have regular buyers and collectors, they're getting more excited because you're creating something very different because it is a step away from reality. But I like it because it's a, quite an opportunity to go much deeper within the possibilities of the art. There's no, there's no end, no edges, no line that you can't, that you can't approach, especially with the different tones of what you can do with a black and white image. And I'll show you that as we get into the demonstrations that the possibilities are endless. It's all up to you. But what I love about black and white photographs is that they are more like reading the book than seeing the movie. You've all heard that line. I think that's a great description of, uh, of about black and white photography. It really is quite a, quite a difference there. Now notice that uh, you have to learn to see a little differently. Um, I talked a little bit about the amber filter and I'll hit that again for those of you who didn't catch that, but black and white photography is such a different way to create that you need to learn to see a little differently. For example, that golden hour, we get up painfully so to get out to those of you have come with me to the workshops and I say, okay, we're meeting the parking lot at 4.30 and everybody goes, no, really? Well, the golden rule is not so much, the golden hour is not so much the golden rule anymore because that soft, subtle light, as beautiful as it is, it's flatter and low in contrast. And in black and white, yeah, you can adjust it somewhat. But dramatic light and higher contrast scenes are much more desirable in black and white. Not only do they, are they stronger, not only do they, <clears throat> allow for a lot more impact in the image, but you've also got a lot more variables, a lot more options to change those shadows and tones if you're working with a higher contrast level. Now, shooting between 10 and three should be part of your normal routine, right? So there's no, no, no naps anymore, sorry gang. So I want you to, when you get a chance, spend some time, study the works of these photographic geniuses. These are my favorites. Of course, Ansel Adams, Minor White was a protege, John Sexton was a protege. Um, obviously, amazingly beautiful scenery. And, and even though they all learn from the same source, their work is tremendously different. Julia Anna Gospodaro, if you're not familiar with her, um, she is an amazing long exposure, black and white photographic uh, architecture photographer. They're buildings, they're bridges, but the, the impact that she creates uh, is just stunning. And I have to say that our, my good buddy Kevin Holiday in the group today is, is right in the line with those footsteps. You've got to go check out his work. I should have your name on this list too, Kevin. Sorry about that. Two of my favorite street photographers, uh, Henri Cartier-Brisson and Fan Ho, were just amazing at the work that they could do. And I believe that had their work been done in color, it might not have been as powerful. These two fellows had such a master of using shadows to tell their stories, look up their work. And of course, my personal favorite, Yosef Karsh, uh, portrait photographer, and I know you all know his work. He's the guy who did something like 15,000 celebrities and, and dignitaries throughout life, all black and white. He's the guy who photographed Winston Churchill, the picture of Churchill leaning on his desk with his hand on his hip, kind of pissed off. The reason for that is because Karsh pulled the cigar out of his mouth right before he made the exposure. Some absolutely beautiful black and white portraits. So check those names out. I think you'll really enjoy that. A couple of the things that will help you see better for black and white, or more better, as it were. I mentioned this little filter, and I'll just tell you that this has been such a huge tool for me. And again, it probably cost me about a buck and a half, maybe. I don't know. This is a old, old, old Gepi was the name of the company, G-E-P-E, -E, slide mount. It's a two and a quarter. Um, it was also referred to as a super slide. You might be able to find something like this on eBay, but I haven't looked and I will. But all I did was to take an amber, see the amber tone there? Just a Roscoe gel. Roscoe's the company, R-O-S-C-O, I believe. I don't think it has an E on it, I don't remember. All it was is just a gel, just a, a, a piece of gelatin. And I cut it to fit, snapped it in this guide and put a lanyard on it so that I could just have it over my head and have it around my neck whenever I needed it. The point is that looking at a scene in color, it's kind of difficult to determine reflected values. The colors tend to get in the way. So this, putting it just in front of your eye and looking at the scene, makes it all monochrome. 
you can get by you can still buy gel gels these days if you go to camera stores or on look online you don't need much um don't need a big piece at all just find a way to put it in some sort of a frame even if it's cardboard and this is plastic and put it in your pocket put it on your neck have it with you. you'll see how much better it lets you see learning to pre-visualize i've talked about this a bit in a lot of the workshops that i do this was ansel adams um, most valuable tool in his camera bag. And I have to agree, it's probably mine as well. Pre-visualizing a scene is the act of standing in front of the scene you're about to photograph and visualizing it as a finished photograph, almost as if you want to see it hanging on the wall already. This is all done before you even push the button. The idea there, obviously, you need to know your gear and your software very well in order to be able to see what you can do to the scene. But that allows you to really create compose and I think it also gives you a, a direction a blueprint on how to finish the image that's a, a great tool for me one of the other things you're going to have to learn we briefly talked about these couple of things in the early on chat there you need to learn to identify contrast ranges and tonal subtleties and I'll I'll get into those two just a little bit but learn how colors translate to black and white tones that's not impossible by any means and it's experience and even further, if you get into using the zone system or parts of understanding that, you will see how you can change those color tones in the black and white at, the, at whatever shades you want. So the zone system. So I want to see how many people I lose when I say the zone system. No, okay, we're good. Um, this was something that Ansel Adams perfected almost a century ago, about the 30s and the 40s of the 1900s. And it's a system, now you don't have to learn this whole thing because a lot of it was about testing your equipment. You had to test your lenses and cameras and in the darkroom, the papers and chemistry and so on. Now with a digital file, you don't need to test anything. You've got all the information there and you can alter it as needed. So the zone system, I'm gonna recommend that you get familiar with it. And what it is, is it is a, it is an 11, uh, it's a, 11 individual areas or zones of reflectivity. I'll show you the scale in just a moment. Zone zero is pure black with no detail. Zone 10 is pure white with no detail. Now you'll notice I said it's okay to use. Reason for that is for some reason in the digital world, it's gotten to be where everybody looks at white. Look at the border around my slide here. That's zone 10. White with no detail is perfectly acceptable. It's part of the, the tonal range. A blown out highlight, you will see glowing, banding, colors introduced, artifacting, and it, it, there's obviously a difference between a blown out highlight. So just having a white area with no detail is okay, folks. Same with black. Now you wanna keep small areas of that. I'll show you some uh, of those areas in the conversions that I do here in a little bit, but by all means, it is okay. You might not use all of the 11 zones, but you certainly will be, um, it's okay to use zero and 10, okay? Now, here's what I think is most important about just getting a real good feel for the zone system. It will really, really help you determine the correct exposure for your scene, whether you're shooting color or black and white. That's huge. It allows you to place the zones where you want them to be to tell a better story. What I mean by that is your meter, all photographic meters by factory set, unless you've changed them, are designed to give you a neutral density, zone five, uh, medium gray, 18% gray, whatever you want to call it. So you will get that every time. If you learn how you can adjust that, you can put your zones on different, different exposures on different zones and have a totally different image. But what I really like about understanding the zone system and recognizing zones is you will really be able to pre-visualize a lot better. I don't know why that doesn't change as fast as I want it to. There we go. All right, so here is the zone system, the zone scale. There are 11 zones, zero on the left being pure black, no detail, 10 on the right being white, no detail, not a blown out highlight. Um, there are 256 shades of gray in every image. Within this zone, there's 256 shades of gray. For example, what you're gonna need to really understand, and this will come quickly, is for example, zone five, middle gray. If you look at the sky, midday, bright sun, no clouds, that's zone five in black and white, roughly. Uh, if you photograph some fresh snow, zone seven, zone eight. 
if you photograph a, a, a scene in the woods or something where there's some heavy shadows underneath a vehicle or rocks or something, you're going to be down in zone three, zone two, which will be some nice deep tones with detail. It's okay. So here's the zone system again. I'm going to chat with you a little bit about contrast range and tonal range. Now the contrast range is the difference of from the shadow area to the highlight area. So whether your scene has all 11 zones or four zones, there's going to be a shadow area and there's going to be a highlight area. Even if you're in the middle of zones three, four, and five, for example, and six, that's right in the middle of the, of the scene here. And it's not, there's not brights and there's not highlights as we think of them, but there definitely are shadows and highlights in there. The tonal range, this is what takes your image up that notch. I'll show you how that works in a couple of conversions here in a moment. So we look at the zones. Look at zone five right in the middle there, for example. From the left side of zone five to the right side of zone five is not the same shade. Remember, there's 256 shades of gray from left to right, 0 to 255. If you do the math, divide that by 11, you get about 23 plus shades of gray per zone. What I'm saying is that this side of zone 5 is darker than this side of zone 5. That's your tonal range right there. This is what you want to work up in your photographs, color of black and white. This is what takes your photographs to that next level. It creates such amazing depth and contour. I mean, we look for the sun and the light to wrap around something. So we have a highlight side and a shadow side to show depth, show shape. But when you can create this tonal range in between, and I don't mean just having the shadow side of the rock be zone one and the highlight side being zone eight, <clears throat> that's just two tones, but it's having the gradation, not only from black to white, but having the tonal range in a zone, that's superb. That's exactly what's going to take your work to the next level. So let's talk about black and white conversions a little bit. I'll break here in a second for questions if you like, but um, let's just chat real quick here. There's, there's about 17 black and white conversions out there that I know of. A lot of them are very complicated. Um, I'm only going to talk about three or four, but real quick, I'm going to show you the, uh, the Lightroom black and white conversion. There's a couple of things that I do in there that are very simple, but very powerful. Photoshop has a few. I'm going to show you the channel mixer and the black and white adjustment layer. If I have time, I'll get into Nick effects. Um, the first two you see there, convert to grayscale and desaturate. Don't do that. Just I'll, I'll, I'll hunt you down. Okay. Once you convert to grayscale or desaturate your image, you have lost all control of your tones. Now you can throw in a levels adjustment layer or a contrast adjustment layer curves and maybe make a little changes but you're still very very limited if no control at all so just don't even do those wiped out okay channel mixer is kind of cool not a whole lot more detailed but it's a fun one to play with it's very quick and easy but the black and white adjustment layer and then i have a little secret i'll share with you how i do that one uh will get you into a a lot more detailed and, and man what it can do with those tonal ranges is amazing all right let's see here let's go to lightroom real quick uh lisa crystal any questions i should jump on right now we we have some questions but i think that they can kind of wait and, and like okay continue. all right that's cool i didn't know if there's any burning ones like where's the bathroom or something like that there, right. is a, there is more questions around that amber slide. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that, uh, like I said, I think that can wait. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We can uh, talk more detail about that one down the line. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks for hanging in there, gang. So, black and white in Lightroom. This scene, to me, just screams black and white. It's beautiful colors. The sand is gorgeous colors. The light was fantastic. It was just probably an hour after sunrise. This is out in Death Valley at the Mesquite Dunes. Um, beautiful mountains behind. You can see the interesting color from low light. It has a very purple cyan cast to it, which is not one of my favorites, by the way. So this to me screams black and white. So the first technique I'm going to show you is just to take and convert using the, the actual filter 
um, dialogue in Lightroom so that um, what I usually do, first of all, is to, you can see my sliders are done to some extent. I've done it just a little bit so that it's where I like um, the image to be if I was to leave it in color. So from there, I'm going to do a virtual copy. If you haven't done a virtual copy, it's basically uh, just one more copy of that image, but it's not an actual file. It's not taking up any storage space at this moment. It's just a reflection or a representation of the original image over here. So at this point, whatever I do to the virtual copy will not affect the original at all. It's kind of like the old way in Photoshop when you would take your image and duplicate it so you wouldn't hurt it. You'd have a, a good copy there. This allows us to have the um, this allows us to have the, um, the the virtual copy, and I can experiment. I can do all kinds of things with. For example, in the basic palette, we're going to click on black and white. And then, if you notice, let me go back a step, show you one thing. If you notice that down here, there is the next palette, HSL and color. Well, if I click on the black and white and make my image of black and white, it changes that HSL color palette dialog box, I should say, to the black and white dialog box. So that's, that's what, that only comes up when you convert the image to black and white. There's an auto button, which a lot of times does a pretty good decent idea, if that's all you're looking for right there. I hit off auto, it made a little bit of adjustments, and it's fine, but we're not gonna settle for fine, are we folks? No. What's happening with these sliders is you're going to adjust the tones, excuse me, uh, the hues of the color, in this case, I'm working with the reds. And as I adjust the hues of the reds, it will adjust and change the shades or the tones of the black and white. So if you see the, the sand itself, I'm getting way lighten on the reds. It lightens all the sand. If I go darker, it gives me some, some darkness to the shadow areas. And I like to go deeper with it because now I've got more contour. See the highlights there and there, and then the deep shadows there and there. Let's see what the orange does. Kind of the same thing, but it's gonna handle, the reds are gonna handle the deeper tones of the sand. The oranges are gonna handle the lighter tones. So I wanna just kind of get some separation, but I don't wanna lose my detail in here. One of the things I'm looking for in black and white is to separate colors. I do this in color as well, but the, I, to, I, I coined the phrase separating colors. Because when you look at a scene, you have yellows and oranges and reds all kind of close together. You have greens and yellows close together and you have blues and cyans and greens close together. So what I want to do is separate or isolate those colors so that they create their own tonal areas, their own contrast areas. And when you do that in black and white, that's where you get that really wonderful tonal subtleties that I was talking about. So by taking the, and, it, and we'll go back to the beginning here, by showing you the you can see if you look carefully, here's the darker sand and here's the highlights. But by separating them even more, I can get more contrast range between those tones, which is going to be more better for black and white. Yeah, I got it in there. How about that? Um, I know there's no yellows are going to be not really much in the scene, no green or aqua, but let's actually the aqua might be a little bit in the mountain zone. Blue. Watch what that does to the background there. Now the background's pretty cool, but it's pretty busy. Lots of lines. I want the viewers to come in, these nice lines coming in here and come right into the curve, this beautiful sweep of this dune right here. And that's my focal point. That's what I want you to see first. So I want to darken that background and the blues will allow me to do that pretty well. The magentas is a little bit, oh, actually we can bring some, a little bit more shadow down into here. I don't think there was much in the way of the purples, about a little bit in the background there. So I can take that background down even more without really making it look all blotchy or, or ugly. So there you go. Now, what I would suggest is going back to the basic panel. Here's a little trick. If you do black and white in Lightroom like this, you want to make sure you go back to the temperature slider and just play with that. By changing the temperature, the color of the light, you can create some more unique and dramatic pieces. Look at that right there, just going right like that. Look at how much more dramatic that has gotten to be. And we didn't lose details soon there. I'm going to give myself a little more highlights and open up the shadows just a little bit more and then give myself a little more whites 
and take the density down just a little bit more. And there you have something pretty dramatic right there. And that's just these sliders in the black and white panel right here. I mean, look at how easy that was to create something that dramatic. So push it. That's why the, the virtual uh, copy works real well because you can push it to an extent um, and really experiment with the different things. Let me show you another black and white. This is the bell tower. This was down in Cuba somewhere. Same thing, I'm gonna make a virtual copy. That way if I don't like it, I can throw it away and I haven't hurt whatever I've done to my original. I've adjusted the sliders the way I like them for the image. So let's convert black and white. Let's go down to the black and white <clears throat> dialog box. And this is, you can see there's a little bit more light coming in from this direction, right? But I want it more dramatic. I wanna tone this down and have the light come in here and get this sky very deep. That's what I'm looking for. This was a very cloudy day. So knowing this, when I shot it, knowing this, if you look at the color, you can see that it was um, kind of smuggy looking. That was an old term from Illinois. So, kind of muggy and, and smoky. We called it smuggy. We could take this scene right now and I can enhance the light coming in from here and deepen this side by just using these sliders and then going back to the basic panel. So let's take the reds, let's see what happens. All right, so notice up on the ceiling right up on the rooftop right here, I can lighten some of those areas to give me some more light direction. Let's open up the oranges a little bit more to see how all of a sudden we get some more brilliance in here. It looks like light direction coming through right here. Yellows are gonna give me more of an overall pattern. Notice how this side has gotten brighter. And I'll tell you that from the histogram, <clears throat> I have not hit the right wall at all. So it maybe looks like I'm starting to get some blow out there, but it's not, I can even go a little bit brighter. Greens, there's a little bit of greens in the texture. So watch that side of the bell tower. Very subtle, but I'm gonna bring it deep, deep in the green so I get more contrast in there. Aqua, should start working on the sky a little bit. But watch the blues. Look at that, look at that great sky. But watch out for some things here. When you start to see the glow, the outlining right there, when that starts to happen, you're getting too much contrast difference between the clouds and the building. So you got to back off a little bit there. What I can do is to go back up to the basic palette and take my exposure, overall exposure down further. And then when I go back to the black and white palette, I can take the blues down a little bit more and you can see I have pretty much, I'll go away, almost eliminated. I'll see it's almost gone there. I've eliminated that outline. It looks like you've cut it out. You've dropped in a fake background. That's not cool. We don't want anybody to see that one. Go away. All right. Purples. Not much in there. Oh, I can take the magenta and I can get a little bit more light in here. I'm gonna go back up to the basic palette here and I'm going to, uh, let's see, let's bring a little more whites into the scene. And notice when I do that, watch what happens to the difference of the sky, the whole, gotta be careful because I start getting a little bit of artifacting up in here, but man, what a difference. We can make this that much more dramatic. Now watch this. Let's grab that temperature scale, as I said before, and see what happens when I change the temperature of the light. Look at how awesome this whole scene becomes all of a sudden. Now we talked about the zone system and referring to this image here, if you look at your histogram, my whites have not hit this wall. So I am probably, I'm gonna say that's probably in the um, zone eight or nine right in there and um, allows me to have all this brilliance without blowing out highlights. I have hit the wall to the left over here and that's gonna be deep underneath this bell in there, maybe back in here. Those are small enough areas, I don't care about that much. If I'm going to make this a large print, 30, 40, 60 inch print, I would do something a little more locally with the bell, make sure that the, uh, the, uh, the bell ringer and all those kind of things stand out a little bit more, a little more detail. Because at this size, there's not a whole lot of black that's a, it's not a black hole that will drive me, uh, the viewer away from I'm looking at it. I'm going to address this little cloud right here. We'll use a gradient and I'm just going to deepen it just a little bit to make it kind of blend so you don't even really see it. So there's a great conversion with just again the sliders in black and white. Let me show you another technique that I do. Let's go back to this guy here. I'm going to make another virtual copy. I'm going to make this one even more dramatic. Let me move my talking head over out of the way here. So I'm going to start with a new crop. So this is This is the crop from the original file, but I'm gonna go even tighter. We're gonna bring this up into here. 
and I'm going to take the top of this down so this this line of this dune hits that corner. It's very dynamic, a lot of movement. It brings us back into the scene here, and that's what I'm trying to create differently here. I still want to bring this as my focal point, so I'm going to again go to black and white, and then go down to the black and white sliders, and we'll kind of do the same thing. We're going to make those reds darker and the oranges a little bit, so I don't lose the highlights there and the scoop. Um, we're going to take the blues down to drop that background even further. And it was purples. I did the same thing there. Okay. We go back here and just take the density down a little bit more. And a lot of times I'll kind of drop it way down just to push it, just to see how far I can go because I want to take these tones of the sand dunes so deep that you can still see the textures, but they're very, very subtle. So let's go with the radial filter. I kind of touched on this. Uh, the other day, a couple weeks ago with the other workshop, and I'll just show you this real quick, but man, is this ever a fun technique? And this is totally, this is almost like just taking a blank slate and starting to paint. So we put this radial filter on here. You do have to invert it. Right now, as I've placed that radial ellipse right there, if I don't invert it, it will affect the background. I just want to affect the ellipse itself. So I have to invert it. It's at the bottom of that out there sliders. Now I can start doing lightening up this area as if it looks like sun is hitting that. But I want to go a little bit brighter. Now, lightening and darkening in, dark, <laughs> darkening in area, you can't just make it lighter or darker. If I just make this lighter, it looks like a flashlight, a spotlight hitting that. We have to do this and leave and keep the integrity of the scene. So I'm going to lighten it, but we have to build our shadows back into it so it looks realistic. You see, it's very subtle, but I just picked up the edge of that slope right there and that little bit of sand trickling down and a little bit of the top of the dune. It's just enough to make it look real. So then I can make it brighter without losing the integrity of that part of the scene. Let's take the blacks in there. And now we have a very interesting looking light. Let's do another one. Let's just take a, I'm gonna actually, let's do this real quick. I'm gonna enlarge this so I can see this. Take a new radial, let's just pop it over this little guy right here. Put it right in place. I have to go down and invert it. Come back up here and now we can lighten it up a little bit. But we need to add some shadows in there. Add a little bit of black so we can make it just a little bit lighter. Okay, so now we have those two going on. So here's before. And after you can see how much more drama this is getting and how many more, how much more uh, interest this image is taking. We grab another radial filter and we're going to take this highlight right here and just pull something right along that. And bring this right in like that. And you can obviously adjust these, invert it real quick. And let's lighten that up just ever so slight. But I need to get some shadows back in there and some highlights, so it looks very real. So now it looks like the sun just hitting these slopes right here, but just trickling over the edge of the dune as it stronger here, as it gradates off into the shadows here. Let's do another one along this ridge right here. Grab the radial, make a nice long one. It's gonna drop it on top of that ridge roughly. Let's make it a little bit narrower. Bring it there, and we'll go invert it. And we'll lighten this slightly, slightly. Let's bring the shadows back into there. Very subtle. At the bottom of this palette, you can turn as a little switch. You can turn it on and off. Let's see, here's where we were. Here's where we've gotten to be. So let's go ahead and turn off the radio so we can see what's going on. You can see how far you can go with this. I mean, you, I will start on a scene and do a few of the obvious places where I want to uh, add some highlights and some shadows and then come back maybe the next day and work those a little more, add to it so it becomes even more interesting. So I just want a very soft light hitting over here. Matter of fact, I have a, by the way, I'm using, um, I forgot to mention this, um, on the feather, I'm using about 50%. So it's falling off very softly so it doesn't look like a spotlight. You can see if I change, it starts looking like a a spotlight otherwise. So use a softer medium tone right there. Again, I'm going to add some shadows, bring up the whites a little bit this time and just make it a little, little bit less. So it's just ever so subtle right there. 
looking pretty cool, A. Eh? Let's just go to this full screen so you can take a peek at it. And I can go in and add a little bit more here. I can add another highlight up here. I can add this another one right here. That's kind of nice. Here's one more idea. I want to define this hill a little bit more. Let's take one more radial. Let's put it right in here. And I'm going to create a shadow with this one. So let's pop it right at the, this side of that sand ridge right there. We'll invert it. And now I can take this and go a little deeper with it. Go down. Same thing. If I don't do that, it's going to be just a big, that's not too bad, but I want to add um, some highlights and shadows to that as well. So we need to add some highlights, add some shadows. We can go just a little deeper. I'm going to stretch it out a little bit more here. So now we have a nice shadow on this side of that bank so that it matches the shadows here and allows that dune ridge highlight to show up too. As you can see, you can just keep going and going. It's just crazy how much you can do right there. All right, moving along, let's jump over to Photoshop here. And let's go to, actually, let's go right here. I want to show you just real quick. Uh, this is a, the finished color picture. And what I want to do is share with you real quick what, um, if you just do a grayscale on this, you will get, or if you just desaturate it, you'll get that look. If you do grayscale, you get a little different look, but you, you're pretty much pinned into those two spots right there. So I wouldn't do that at all. Um, but here's one of the fun ones. Let's take a channel mixer, at the bottom of the layers palette. You go up into this list here and you hit channel mixer. Channel mixer, let me just show you in the channels dialog box here. Let's just turn off. Here's what the blue channel looks like. Here's the green channel. Here's the red channel. You see the vast difference between what the greens and blues and reds all look like. So that's what we're going to do with this. Under preset, there's some, if you want an infrared look, you can do that. If you want to, here's with a red filter, you can do some pretty much um, preset things that everybody likes presets. But if you want to do your own, click on the monochrome box and you can move these sliders as to whatever density you want those tones to be. And I can change it. I can make it more of an infrared and I can take that sky and go really deep and such. But notice down there's numbers at each slider and right below it, here's a line that says total. You want that number to be at 100, right around 100. And you notice when I go above 100, I get a little warning sign. I'm starting to clip. I might lose some details in prints if I make prints out. So keep it around 100 or below. But you can see what you can change as much as you want right here. You can make those reds darker and I can make the greens lighter and it's pretty, pretty fun what you can do as far as that for the channel mixer. And that's a simple one right there. Here's one I did before that I kind of liked. It's kind of a infrared look with the reds. The greens could be lighter, but I just like that the reds stood out more there. Okay, my favorite one is the black and white <clears throat> adjustment layer. And what I'm gonna do is go down here and grab the um, black and white adjustment layer. This puts a layer mask layer next or right above your image and kind of gives you a rough. There's an auto. You can click on that and it kind of gives you what it thinks is a good tone. But again, what's fun about this, these are the same sliders as we used in Lightroom. And you are now adjusting the hue of the colors, which adjusts the tones in black and white. I mean, what color do you want your poppy to be? Or I should say, what shade do you want it to be? But the cool thing about this breakdown now is if you remember before, I only had three sliders and I had a maximum to watch out for. You don't have to do any math here. I can make those reds pretty bright and I can make the yellows of the green, the, the green tones. Yellows will affect the brighter greens. Greens will affect the darker greens. So now I can get a pretty serious infrared going on here. Let's bring those reds back down so we don't blow those out. They were kind of blowing out right there. Let's take the cyan, see who does the sky. See, now it's getting really cool. And the, bl the blues are going to take it way deep. You, gotta, you can't go too far. Notice I'm losing clouds over here. That's not cool. Let's go like in here. Magentas, watch this particular poppy right here. I can adjust the shade of that very subtly, but I can do something like that with the black and white adjustment layer. <clears throat> Let me go on and show you another one here. And I have another little trick that I do or after I do the black and white adjustment layer that I'll share with you here in just a minute. Same idea here, we're gonna go down and get the black and white. I mean, I have this image just finished for a color. I like it the way it is in a color image, but I'm gonna take it into black and white. And it puts kind of a 
basic black and white. You can hit auto, didn't really do much. But that's pretty flat looking. But here's the cool thing. Remember I was talking about separating colors? Isolating the yellows from the greens and from the cyans is gonna make, if you remember the, there's a lot of lichen that stands out on the hood of this vehicle. See all the lichen and the moth, moss. And then of course all the rusty metals and such. So we put that black and white on there, but I want to bring that back out. So I can adjust the reds if I want the, the reds of the rusty metal to be darker, if I want it to be lighter, totally up to you. There's an area on the hood right here that has, if you see the, rust, the red right there, that's bare metal. And then there's moss and lichen growing all around it. So I want to kind of separate those more. And with the reds, I can make that a little bit brighter. With the yellows, you can, notice how the lichen all of a sudden jumps out at us there. And then with the greens, I can make it stand out even more over here. Cyan's in this particular scene, there's not much. It's a reflection of the sky. Just watch this window right up here. Let's go for the blues because I know there's not many cyan, but you see that blue? Now that's actually window where there is no moss growing. So that's a true reflection of skylight on that window. So I don't want that to stand out too much. I want it to kind of just a little bit right there. We'll take the cyan's down, which kind of blends it even more. Magenta's not a whole lot. Okay, here's the cool thing. There's a selective color layer that <clears throat> I'm going to add um, right here in the middle of these two layers. I want it to be above the color layer image and below the black and white. I now have a lot more control of my tones of, my sh of the shades of gray or the hues of the color. So this is, if you notice, this is a, this is a rather advanced, complicated, um, palette and I want you to know that this is how this is called subtractive color. This is how we printed in a color dark room. It was rather confusing. With your three red, green, and blue colors, we would actually use cyan, magenta, and yellow filters to subtract those tones, those hues from red, green, and blue to get the colors we wanted. I know it sounds backwards, but that's how that works. So it's the same principle. I'm in the reds right now. So all these sliders are gonna affect the reds. This is a whole workshop in itself, but I'll just, just trust me. First thing I wanna do is grab the black slider and just see if anything happens. This is always very subtle, but notice that red area here and right along there. If I lighten the reds, see how it stands out? Now I've got, these are the, these are the tonal subtleties that I've been talking about. You can bring these out in an image, you're gonna have an outstanding black and white image. I'm gonna add cyan to the reds or take reds away and I can see how if you get very slightly the reds are popping out a little bit more. This is a very subtle thing. You also have to play this yourself at home. The yellows, I can make the yellows stand out or separate them by making them darker. Now look at the light and how that stands out even more. Let's go down to the whites. I don't think we'll get a whole lot of help there out of this one, but let's do the greens. Got another image I'm gonna show you that stands out even more. If you notice the foliage and the grass, the trees over here, the greens, I can take those down. And now I have a whole lot of detail in this black and white as opposed to just, we turn off the subtle. This is a very detailed image by just what the tone of it, but adding the black and white is nice, but being able to have the control of those tones more so with the selective color layer is pretty darn cool. I love that technique. Let's go to the great autumn display here. This, is, this will really show you how that works. Again, I'm gonna take the black and white layer, take those sliders. Now this has got, as you saw, bring this up out of the way here, awful lots of reds, yellows, greens in this scene, lots of cyans and blues. So we're gonna see a lot of change here. And this is again, this is very artist's choice right here. This is, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever you think this works best. So I'm going to start with the reds, and you can see where there's an awful lot of reds in there. And when I brighten up the reds, I get kind of that infrared look, which is fine if you like, but I don't want to go that bright with it. But if I do the yellows, there's more yellows and oranges than there are reds, so all of a sudden now I have a brighter overall feel to it. So I can actually take the reds back down a little bit and start getting the tonal range that I'm looking for, the, the feelings of slight differences from one shade or one zone to the next. This is a hard scene to look at in terms of zones because there's so many little little areas. Hey, Greens. Jeff. Yes. I hate to interrupt you, but we Go have ahead. a question that you might be able to demonstrate on this particular image. Um, okay. 
Can you talk about the tonality and the contrast that you're looking for when you work on the images? Um, yeah, okay, sure. So the, ton the tonal range of the contrast. Um, I don't know that there is a pat answer for that. Um, it's how you want the image to look. When I'm done, I want this valley to be lit up in this, this side of the mountain to be lit up just a little bit more than the sky and this side of the valley. So in building the tones, again, I'm, I'm looking at the, I used to have a cutout of the zone system, the scale just taped right on, actually taped on the wall in the dark room. But I used to have it here by my computer and I could kind of emulate tones in a scene with these sliders to match certain areas. Which ones are right, which ones are wrong, there is no answer for that. It's what you feel like. But as you learn, and I'll tell you, in your yellows and oranges, you're gonna be in the higher zones. You're gonna be six, seven, eight, nine, more, probably more in the uh, eight or nine ranges. So if you look at the yellows when I go brighter, that's lifting those whites, those highlights into the higher zones like eight or nine. If I come back down here, I can take those, I can look at, I can make that, this area right here, I can make that bright yellow a zone five. I can make it a zone three. That's the, I think the beautiful thing of all this is that you can do that with the tones and create and which is right, which is wrong. There isn't, it's what looks good to you. What feels right. This obviously doesn't feel right and neither does this. So does this right? Is this right? Well, that's why I, I definitely do things in layers and never flatten my work because we're artists. We keep changing our minds. We keep changing our vision. I'll come back to this image in a month, two months, three, uh, three years later and be wanting up. Oh, that should be, I think that should be up here and this should be up here. So I'm just looking to get a good variety of those zones or that tonal range throughout. I want to have this feeling that it's not all too bright here. So it goes bright to dark. That's a big jump right there. But having it where it's a little bit more, there's a lesser change, but it looks more realistic. It looks more subtle and feels like there's more texture and more contour in that area than if it's a really bright thing like this that stands out. So that might be the measure. Even that doesn't look too bad, but the higher contrast is not necessary. I talked about that earlier. I said dramatic light and higher contrast, but what I was referring to is photographing in those situations because then it gives you the option to be able to come here and leave this wherever you see fit, wherever you think is best for the scene. So I would probably like that in this zone right about here. And <clears throat> that's what the black and white, that makes a pretty nice tonal range right there in black and white. I know the zones are covered here. We have a zone. If you get up close, there'll be a zone 10 right in there, white with no detail. Most of that is zone nine even down to eight maybe. You come down in these shadows right here. Those are getting way down into probably zone one. There's probably even some zone zero. And, and I just really feel good that, that we can, I should take this image and study it sometime and let you guys see and I could label, but we're probably looking at zone four right in there. Um, zone five probably in that area. So I mean, we can do this some other time, but let me just share with you the rest of this technique. I'm gonna go back and take that selective color layer and put in between my image, my black and white layer, and start playing with the colors. Now this is even more subtle. Let me enlarge this a little bit here. And you can see this is a, to me this is a good one to really practice on getting tonal ranges, but there's really not one area that gives you a good solid zone to see the feeling through it. But as I enlarge the image, you can see the detail and the, the texture change, the highlight right there, and that goes in a little shadow right there. There's a little highlight there and some shadow. I mean, these are the things, especially when you go to a large print, especially when you take this up to uh, a 40 or 60 inch print. My, what a difference that these textures are gonna just seem lifelike. It makes it more dimensional. Uh, let's see, selective color, all right. So the reds, very subtle. Let's go back down here a notch because most of the reds are along in here. 
It's very subtle. You probably won't see much there. Oops, that's because I said put it in between. <laughs> Must be late there. So you can see I can kind of control the reds a little bit more here. So I'm controlling more, more the overall tone of the reds without changing my tonal range too much. Let's go to the yellows and I'm going to go back down. So you can see how I can bring the yellows up. Now I've brightened the yellows without blowing them out. When I went in, in my black and white box, the yellows were fine, but it gave me okay to blown out look, right? When I go to the selective color, I have now an even finer tune, a smaller dial on the TV set, if you will, that allows me to control those highlights even tiny bit so that they get to be bright without losing any detail. If I want to add more yellow to that tone or, or take some away, I can do that. But this is really creating that tonal range I've been talking about. Um, the blues, here's an interesting one. Somebody asked me a question last time. I didn't get to it. Um, I was looking at the questions afterwards. I believe it was David Saldano. David, if you're on today, um, he mentioned that I always get my snow looking very crisp and white and stands out on a mountain. Here's kind of how I do it. Here's what I'm looking at. Whites have an awful lot of reflected light from the sky, whether it's a soft blue sky or a bright blue midday, you're going to get a lot of blue in there. As we stand there and look at it, our brains adjust for this. It doesn't see the blue. These darn cameras, man, you can't fool them. Well, actually they don't lie, but you sure can fool them. So taking the picture and getting all this blue in this white of the snow makes the snow look kind of blah. So when I take the blue slider, and again, this can be very subtle, so don't, it's gonna change the sky a lot, but look into the sky, let me get up here closer. Especially in this, these fanules right here, watch what happens with the blues. See how I can just, it's kind of changing the shadows, but those are blue and cyan color casts in the snow. So I can take that out, I can lighten it up, and I get a cleaner looking snow. But if I go darker with it, I get better shadows. So it's just kind of a, what do you like better? In color, I would definitely take this to the lighter side. I would get a cleaner looking white snow. Black and white, I'm going to think in the opposite. Now I get some great shadows. Look at the contour now that is built up from the rise of this, these, between these fanules and the sunlight hitting this west side into the shadow side here. Another thing that happens in the greens, watch this valley right here. Let me bring this over in front of you here. So when I play with the blues, very subtle, but watch the shadows of this little valley right here. When I make them darker, you see how they get darker and they get lighter. When I go smaller and look at the overall scene, again, for black and white, I'd probably go darker because it gives me more of a contour of this crest of trees right here. And I might go in and do a burn and dodge and pull that back a little bit, but I like the contour of this valley right here. It's giving us some nice feel. So it's just a matter of choice of your, your call at that. If you want to see more um, shadows and highlights or less of a tone. So again, I use the same concept in color photography. We'll take it to the left with the lightness so that I don't get the blue in the snow. But in black and white, I'm going to go to the right to give me more of the shadows to create that look right there. Let's see. Let me do, we got enough time. Let me do one more here. We're going to go to the Everybody's, whoops, I don't want that open. So sorry. We're going to go to everybody's favorite here. <clears throat> the bus driver sees all. This was a very fun workshop at Old Car City. Uh, a few of you have gone with me on that one. And it is um, definitely a fun uh, venture with 34 acres of cars and trucks with about 4,500 vehicles in the woods. Man, what a photographer's dream. We go there for four days and we'll shoot for three and a half of those days and not cover half this place. It's just crazy. So if anybody's interested in that, let me go. I'd be glad to take you there. It's one of my favorite places. So what I'm going to do here, and this, there's a lot of pre-work you can do on an image like this to go into silver effects, but Let's just do that right from this image that I find to be uh, acceptable in color. And we're gonna take this in the image, Silver Effects Pro. I kind of hesitate because I was having a little trouble with it last time. 
we'll see if it works for me today. Here we go. Silver Effects brings us up some presets, some suggested tones on the left over here. This is neutral. There's some different ones. You can pick what you like. A lot of times I'll go for high structure and then that's, that's high structure harsh and high structure smooth. I like the smooth because it's not, this image can handle a lot of texture. It looks great with all the grungy feel. It was a photo stack. First focus point was right here. Then the back of the steering wheel, because I think I was using about a 15 millimeter lens right here. So from here, first one, second one, back of the seat. Then I did like one of these here, back here, then the back of the bus. And I even did one more outside of the trees. So I want to say there was one, two, three, four, maybe six or seven uh, focal stacks that I put together. Man, this thing just worked out real well in terms of laying out for focus. It's sharp from the very edge of the frame to the very back of the outside trees in the bus. Anyways. I'm going to move this, move my talking face over here so I can show you. Silver Effects Pro, if you have not used it or if you've used it very little, it's all shut down like this. So when you go up in global adjustments, there are brightness, contrast, structure sliders, which you can move by yourself that way, or you can open them up and now you can control the highlights of the brightness or the shadows of the brightness. Very, very detailed way to adjust your image. But I like to go down here under film types. And when you open that up, there's even another one here called sensitivity. This is all closed down. Sensitivity has those sliders that we've been using, which is wonderful. But even more so, right underneath this layer right here are some film types. There's a film I used to shoot with years ago that was just stunning. It was, it was a 32 ISO Kodak Panatomic X-Man. This is what we called a red dead film. It, just totally blocked out reds and made them black. It was wonderful on photographing. Um, you get that character with the roadmap face and the white hair. Oh wait, I'm talking about myself here. Uh, and, and man, with the, the film, you could just get this just wonderful textures. This was kind of like the grunge, early grunge filter back in the 70s and 80s. So I've picked that to start with. And the red sliders are the same way. It can adjust that and adjust the tones of the scene by just the reds or the yellows. So I'm taking the yellows down to kind of not lose the outdoors there. I'll take the greens down to do the same thing. So I picked up a little bit more detail in there so it doesn't get lost. I don't have blown out highlights there. That's a little bit, that's white, but that's not a blown out highlight. You've got nine, zone nine, zone zero right here. You've got zone one in here. And you know, this is this is a, a how-to on a zone system right here. So using all these sliders allows us to do some really, really wonderful things. And again, there's not a right or a wrong. I'm sorry, I know a lot of you are looking for answers, but there's not a right or a wrong here. It's very much, what do you want to see? So I, then I'll come back up here and play with all of these other sliders. The shadows are a little bit deep, so I can go into the brightness of the shadows. And let's open up those shadows a little bit. See, it just got a little bit brighter, so now I didn't lose anything here and so on. We'll just hit okie dokie and bring it to a close. And you can see what this likes. And then, oh, maybe I closed it so far that it crashed it. Hey, it crashed Photoshop. Must be time to answer questions. Hold on just a sec here. Let me stop the sharing and hi, gang. Oh, Lisa and Crystal are muted. Okay, Jeff, you've got about uh, eight questions. And well, I've got I've gotten more answers than that. So come on, you guys. No, go ahead. <laughs> That's a good thing. All right. We're, we're in luck. Um, can you talk about the amber filter again? Oh, sure. Okay. The purpose of the amber filter. All right. Let me step back one more step to go out and look at a scene and a color scene and to try and determine it for black and white. It's a little tough because the colors get in the way. I talk about colors like they're bad and they're not. I don't mean it that way at all. But it makes it easier to recognize the tones of black and white when you don't have to see the colors. Does that make sense, everybody? Everybody do this. I'm knocking my headphones off. Thank you, Corey. Uh, <laughs> so what I did, hey, I'm going to lose the headphones. Hold on. <laughs> so what I did was to take something that I could look through and knock out the colors make it a monochrome scene so that I can concentrate on the tones of the reflected surfaces and not be stuck into the colors. 
All this is, is is an amber gel. You could probably do a light blue or a gold or anything. Just go get Roscoe filters. There's other brands too, but this was the big name back in the day. And it's just a, it's just a gelatin. It's a thin uh, filter. That's why they call them gels. And all you have to do is cut a piece and put a, take a cardboard and just tape it to a piece of cardboard. It doesn't have to be pretty at all. I put a lanyard on it so that it was right here all the time. You guys have gone and shot with me. You know, I have the, the little Spanish girl around my neck all the time, Lupe, and this hung right with her. So what it would do is I just simply pulled it up in my view and it would take all the colors and make them monochrome with an amber cast. But what that did was allow me to see what the sun was hitting in that scene and where it was reflecting in different areas. If that rock was brighter than that rock or if the water was darker than the sky and all those kind of things. So it definitely um, gave me um, uh, an advantage of seeing a black and white or a monochrome scene um, and getting those colors out of my face. So I didn't have to deal with that. Jeff, Make sense? can you put the amber filter in front of your webcam? No, like, yes. <laughs> Is that Does what work? you're looking for? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it doesn't go, it doesn't, it goes yellow, it goes gold, but you can, if you see, if you look at this and you can see the, the brightness of the wall and the blue in the picture, what can I point? The blue of the picture and my shirt and my skin tone, when I put something amber or monochrome in front of it, it just takes the color out of it pretty much. It's, this is very rudimentary, but it gives me more tones and shades than it does colors. Now I can look at my skin tone and see that the difference between this side of my face and this side of my face is probably a zone and a half, honestly, a stop and a half. It's another thing to keep in mind. A zone is equal to one stop of exposure. Back in the day, black and white film had about yeah, nine to 10 stops of, um, uh, of dynamic range. We didn't call it that then, but that's what it is now. We know it. And um, yes, uh, Rich just said amber sunglasses. Sure, if you had some amber sunglasses, it would do the same thing. Anything that's gonna cut the colors sunglasses, I don't care, whatever it is, anything that's going to cut the colors and make it a monochrome color. So if it's, it doesn't have to be amber. Amber was the nicest, the easiest to use. It can be a very soft rose or a gold or a yellow. But don't get a dark color because then you won't be able to see through it very well. Um, forgot where I was in the other step line. I jumped in that one. forgot where I was before that. Anyways, um, so the idea there is to allow you to look past the color, if you will, so that you can see the reflected values of the rocks in the scene. Um, if you have many different uh, angles of rocks that the light is hitting, it's gonna have this one into the light is gonna be a brighter tone than this one that's more towards the camera or one that's facing away from the sun. You can see those are different densities and that would be probably three different, different stops of light. So it allows you to build that zone um, zone system, and zone scale in your in your mind. Once you get really familiar with it, again, it's not a lot to know. It's just recognizing quickly things like, okay, that that green um, exposed at a scene um, will be a zone three. Green might be zone four, might be zone two. I don't know. It just depends. So, all right, for example, I was talking about the meter in your camera being set calibrated for zone five. That's true across the board. That's how they make meters. They just make them zone five. Some people can adjust them and so on and so forth, but not so much anymore. We used to do that back in the day. So let's say you walk out in the morning, there's a fresh snowfall, bright sky, nice, uh, fresh white grays in the snows. And if you point your camera at that and just use whatever metering system you want to use, it doesn't matter. It's going to give you a zone five exposure. So when you go home and sit down and look at that snow, it's going to be gray. It's going to be a mid-tone gray or close to it. And then you think, I'm no good. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this right. No, it's just the system worked perfectly. It gave you a zone five. But if you know that and your whole scene is that bright, you know that you can look at that scene and allow an exposure and basically shifting that zone five exposure that the meter is going to give you up one, two, three stops so that you get white snow. Now, of course, the cool thing about a raw file is that you can do that, but you still have to have an idea 
of why you're snow and gray, right? But why you sit down and think, oh, that's not, that's not what it looked like in my mind. Well, it the meter did its thing. It did what it's supposed to do, but you now have to, with your artistic prowess, need to adjust that white snow for white snow. Same thing happens the other way. If you walk into a, a forest and you have very low light level and you have all these beautiful colors and leaves and low light, wonderful, deep, rich colors, and you photograph it with your camera on, again, any of the zones, any of the metering systems, it's going to give you a zone five, which will take all those deep grays and make them medium gray. Well, again, that's not what you want. In the days of film, we would adjust the exposure knowing that, okay, I don't want it that dark so I can adjust the exposure to give me a little bit less density in those areas. But nowadays, again, with, with uh, if you hit your histogram with your uh, graph right in the middle, you have all that range to move it and put your midtones on the zone five or whatever. Um, that's the beauty of the zone system and digital photography now. It gives you a chance to alter the exposure of your image to match what you saw, to match the story, to match the the feelings, the emotions you were sharing, uh, as, feeling as you were making that exposure. Next question. That was a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> you, well, who are you talking to here? You know I don't have short answers. <laughs> I like it. Sorry, anyway, gang. For, here's the next question. For black and white, what are the benefits of having a camera converted to infrared? How does a, a photo that is shot with an infrared compare to a photo shot with a standard camera and converted process to black and white? Okay, so that was a long question. So my answer is no, nah, don't bother. No. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white and infrared, while they look similar, are quite different in how light is captured. Obviously, infrared is a whole different wave of light that we can't see with our eyes. Whereas you can emulate, like I was showing you with those poppies, you can emulate an infrared scene. But I can tell you that nine times out of 10, if I shot two scenes with a regular uh, uh, camera that wasn't converted and convert it to a black and white image and then shot the same scene with the black and white infrared, you would see an amazing difference between the two just because of that, the fact that it's different light. So it's really hard to compare black and white and infrared. Um, I have a camera that I converted a few years ago to infrared and it's absolutely, it's pure, I would say it's purely a leisure thing. Um, if you go to some of these companies like uh, Life Pixels, I guess is it, is it one of them? Life Pixels? Where they do conversions, they also have cameras for sale and they have pretty good prices on them. Um, there's no such thing as a lens. Somebody asked me that recently about buying a lens for infrared. There's no such thing as an infrared lens. Um, well, at, at our level, there's you know scientific ones, but um, there's no need to go buy a specific lens for infrared. Don't let anybody sell you one of those. Any lens will work fine. It's what the light and the sensor captures that um, makes it infrared. So Infrared is purely a leisure thing, Pure, purely a fun um, thing. If you shoot one, you'll, if you buy one, you convert it, whatever, you'll have a blast with it. Now, just know that there's a fair amount of work in converting. It's not, it doesn't just shoot it the way you see it, boom, you're done. Go to lifepixels.com, look at their sample page, because you can choose different nanometer uh, uh, ranges of light to get different color and black and white um, ranges of infrared. You shoot it, it doesn't look like that. There's conversions and there's tricks and tips and all kinds of techniques that you have to do to get those images looking that way with your sliders and Lightroom and so on. So it's not hard to do, but it's it's not, don't shoot it and think that you uh, um, are gonna nail it. You have to do some work at it, but it's a blast and you'll get addicted to it. Sorry, you will. Question or I see Corey has his hand up. What's up, Corey? No, we've got yeah. 11 questions. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Corey. Hang on, bud. We'll get these other All ones good. first. All good. <laughs> um, do you recommend tweaking the photo on color to the way you like it first and then doing the black and white conversion? I do. I do. Okay. That, oh my gosh, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make your job easy, Crystal. <laughs> oh, okay. like Next. It. Okay. Does Jeff make black and white? before using silver effects, silver effects? And does he send the color image into silver effects before black and white? Okay. Um, 
making a black and white and then sending it to, to Silver FX Pro to me is kind of pointless. The changes that I'm going to do in Silver FX Pro are going to be based on the black and white. So I want to have full control of the tones, the shades of gray, and, and all the other things that are involved in putting it. So I'll bring a color image into Silver FX Pro. This is just, this is just my I know of people who do, there's some tutorials of people who bring black and white into Silver FX Pro, which is fine, but I would rather just bring the color image. But yes, I will f I will push the image to where I want it to be, to be a good color image. Then I'll bring the color image into Silver FX Pro. Cool. Do you ever use a range mask with your radial tool with the exposure adjustments? Um, I have. Um, it's cool. I don't... I guess I haven't used it enough to say whether it's worth it or not. Uh, it's more work. Um, I've used the range mask in other um, luminosity functions with the, just brushing certain areas. Um, so I, I guess I should play with it more before I really say if it's worthwhile doing or not. It probably is if you know it. I just haven't done it enough to really answer that question. Yeah, yeah, go do it or no. So right now I can't say. Is the channel, oh. Is, is the channel mixer is based on the Bayern pattern from the camera? Based on what? The, um, the um, it doesn't make sense to me. The, the Bayern pattern from the camera? I guess I'm not sure. Is the channel mixer based on the Bayern pattern from the camera? Um, I'm not sure what that technique or pattern you're talking about is not familiar enough with it to really answer it. So sorry, I can't really say. Okay. Does you does he ever use black and white to enhance his color images? If so, how does he do it? And what is he trying to accomplish by doing this technique? Have you seen my Cuba portfolio? That's the answer. I'm not going to share it with you. It's my, it's my <laughs> formula. <laughs> I use a combination of um, the color effect, the, excuse me, this uh, selective color uh, adjustment layer, a um, couple of texture overlays, the Silver FX Pro version, and reduced opacities and brushing, masking, and all kinds of things to give me a, not a vintage look, I call it soft color. So it almost has a feeling of a watercolor um, look, and uh, I don't have any Cuba pictures on this computer to show you right now, but um, so yes, I do that quite a bit actually in my old cars and my Cuba pictures. So it gives it, it's basically lowering the saturation without just lowering the saturation. It's altering the saturation of colors. Um, but that's one of my little secrets. Sorry. <laughs> my mom said I could not tell everything. That's true. Um, on the last photo of the bus, how did you add the red and green back in? Was that after making it black and white? Oh, before I went to black and white? Is that what you're saying? Because well, the, the color image was, was a green and, and magenta. Yeah, how did you add tone. the red and green back in? Was it after making it black and white? Okay. Um, that image was, as I said, it was a focus stack. So it was a full color image. It was, it was low colors because the bus was just worn out but the seats were green you know the lovely green vinyl of old bus seats and of course the yellow from the paint um so i basically took it down to a black and white and used a gradient map split tone technique to put um magenta in the highlights and greens in the shadows to give it that green magenta cast green and magenta are opposite on the color wheel so it's very complementary um, then when I took it into um, Silver FX and made it a black and white, I actually, um, hang on, I'm going to go back there real quick if I can do this real fast. And, oh no, Photoshop crashed. Sorry. Um, what I did in the finish, I didn't do it here for you guys. So what I've done on that one is I took then the black and white layer from Nick effects and just took the saturation or the um, opacity down a little bit to let the colors come back through. So that's why the green and the magenta were very, very faint. It almost looked like a maroon and a cyan, um, but it just gave it a almost like a, a washing, like you would wash something with color, not a watercolor, but you just 
very subtle color, just, you know, wash it on certain areas of a, of a photograph, of a painting, actually. Next. Okay, to separate colors, say red from orange, do you think about trying to place them on different zones or perhaps different sides of the same zone? Um, yes, would be the correct answer for that one because depending on how saturated the reds and the oranges are, for example, would be what would allow you to either separate them far enough to put them on different zones or if they just end up being on, on two sides of one zone. Um, that's not something I can really figure out how to do or show you how to do. It's just kind of a something that can happen. Um, but as I use, and I do this in my color processing all the time as well, is to take all, especially when there's a lot of colors like that last scene um, in, uh, in Colorado there, um, is to try and separate the yellows from the greens. The yellows are usually going to be in the highlights. But a lot of times if you ever go on and use the yellow slider and, or use the green slider, nothing happens and yet there's a lot of green in the scene. It's because it's mostly yellows. But I try and use, think of a, a, a nice row of uh, trees up against the mountainside and it looks rather flat even though it's got a nice colored green to it. The green slider of whatever tool you might be in, you lighten that and then you lighten the um, the yellow slider, you're going to get the highlights on the top of the trees are going to stand out more because that's more yellows, whereas the underneath shadows of the trees are going to be more in the, the greens or the cyans and you'll get a deeper tone. So you can separate those colors enough to really give it uh, a crest feeling from the highlights of the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree where the shadows are. Next. Alrighty. I talk about the story of an image. It seems like the bus has way more storytelling than the landscape. So, yes. Um, not every photograph that you make is going to have a heartstring pulling story. Um, I have every image that I've ever photographed, I have my own story. Some of them are very... Um, powerful, um, tear jerking, real, real story from my life. Many of my images have stories that I kind of made up as I went along because it fit that picture. Um, but those, those stories don't matter to the rest of the world, at least my point of view. As I'm working on an image, the story is, the feelings, the emotion is strong enough as I'm working the image. I feel like, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, but I have a program tomorrow night for the Colorado Springs Guild group. It's called Finding Your Why. Um, Corey, you remember I did some of this in Nebraska last year at the uh, convention there. And it's when you get so connected with the scene, and it's like when I pull up there to, show, to shoot somewhere, I get out of the car without my camera. I walk around and just connect with the scene. And when you do that, you can put those feelings into this photograph. You can put what's in here into that photograph. So I don't believe I have to tell you or the viewer my story because if I infuse those feelings and the, the, the emotions in there, it should be strong enough that when you come along and see the picture that it'll, it'll evoke your own stories. Um, I mean, I can tell you some stories and they're kind of uh, comical and, and serious and whatever, but creating stories is not so much about, it's more about just connecting. Now, storytelling is going to be stronger in photojournalism portraits, things like that, or it could be um, the connection of the couple in the scene or the kids or whatever, grandpa and the baby and things like that. Some a little more obvious things. But when you get into someone walking down the street or the, what I loved about going to Cuba, those of you who went with me, you know, the stories we saw in the streets and, and the, the, just the wonderful connection that we had, with, we, we made with all those people in the areas that we visited. And it was again, more about just putting my feelings and my emotions into the scene because I've showed a lot of uh, my Cuba images to people and they'll tell me stories. It may not be the story I had in my mind, but that doesn't matter. I was doing a gallery show once years ago and I had this picture of a, a black and white scene and it was an old, old barn. Uh, it was one of those old barns, and an old farm that you could tell it was just oak planks, probably, you know, five, eight, uh, five quarters thick, just cut right from the tree. Grandpa made this box of a building, put a roof on it big oak branch growing over the top of it. And this elderly lady was standing at this image and I couldn't get over there right away. I, I felt bad. Everybody kept asking me questions and so on, which, you know, that's what happens. 
I finally got over there and I got there and she had tears running down her face and I felt bad because I don't know, was she mad because I didn't get there or whatever? And I asked her, oh my gosh, are you okay? What's going on? Which I've since learned to ask a different question. I'll tell you about that later. She said, thank you. Thank you for sharing my memories with me again. My grandpa, when I was a little girl, my brother and I would go to grandpa's farm and he had a building just like this. And he taught us how to build bird houses, play checkers and chess in that barn. And that's all I can see is us sitting in there playing this. And we both started, you know, tears rolling down the cheeks and everything. And that's what it's all about. And so it wasn't my story per se. I had a story similar to that of my grandfather in a building he used to have. That's why this image happened. But I believe my feelings and my emotions went into that image as I made it. And she pulled out what she could and wanted to and had her own story from it. So that's another seminar in itself, but that's storytelling. That's putting titles on images and telling stories is really, like I said, more about what you do with the image so that it evokes those emotions from the viewer. That was the long version as opposed to the short version. Next. <laughs> Jeff, that's great. Um, I, it's a wrap. We're at 8.30.